today we are starting a new series for this month that is called Attributes of God. Attributes of God. This whole year we've actually been going over foundations of our faith that we believe that are maybe basic but are fundamental to our faith. And I hope you've been enjoying every month that we've been going over all these different foundations from Scripture to doctrine to prayer to the Sabbath. And today is this progression now to talk about the attributes of God, who God really is. And of course, you'll see my title today is to talk about God being holy. God is holy, which is basically going to be like me trying to gather all of the ocean and put it into a little bottle. So this should be really easy for me to do, right? To talk about how do you sum up the holiness of God? The holiness of God, what am I doing? I haven't got a clue what I'm doing here, but here's week by week breakdown. Week one will be God is holy, next one is God is merciful, God is our Father, God is unchanging, and God is truth. Now there are so many other attributes that we could talk about. We could talk about from, from the fact that God is immutable, He is wise, He is good, He's gracious, He's just, He's sovereign. There's so many, but here's a basically just a few fundamental basics of our faith about understanding who God is. Now, why would we want to study this? Just because we want to sound holy or religious, because we want to become more knowledgeable? It's, it's, it's more than that. It's simply because of this. How you understand God is how you live. How you understand God is how you live. You can't say you know or believe something about God and not live it out. If you don't live it out, then you don't know that about God. There must be something that is disconnected. And, and, and this, through this whole year, you've been hearing me saying uh, two words consistently, and that is the connectivity between your belief and your behavior. Your belief and your behavior. Those two things must be connected together. They must come together in a union to actually have real faith. Why? Because a high view of God leads to a high way of living. A high view of God leads to a high way of living. There's many times when I'll be in counseling or, or mentorship or discipleship with people, and sometimes I'll hear their fears and their worries, and I always have to go to the place and go, I don't really think you believe that God is a good God. And they'll go, no, no, I know that God is good. I don't think you do know that God is good. Because if you did, you wouldn't have all this worry and fear that is dogging you in your life. You believe that God is a good God for someone else. He's just not a good God for you. And then oftentimes what happens is when those, those worries and fears build up into resentment. And, and resentment basically gets to the place where you don't believe that God is a fair God. You don't believe he's an actual merciful God. You don't actually believe that he wants to care for you. And resentment can build up inside of you. I've even seen this with people that are maybe taking life too easily. And they're a little bit lazy in their faith. And I'm like, ah, I don't actually think that you believe that God is a demanding God. Because in the New Testament, there are so many different uh, 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 parables that talk about how God expects fruit from us. He expects us to live as Christians. It fundamentally comes down to this. Your theology determines your doxology. Gosh, that's a, big, that's a big sentence right there. What does all those words mean? Theology is the study of God, and your doxology is the worship of God, how you live it out. That's the connection between your belief and your behavior. Your belief and your behavior. If you don't fundamentally have your theology in the right place, if your belief is not right, then there's no way you can live right. It's not possible. That's why we study the Scripture so much, so that we can get a greater revelation. So therefore, it makes us holy. It makes us like God. Therefore, if you don't understand God, you can't live like Him. You can't be like Him. But Peter, how can anyone know God? It's like taking the ocean, trying to put it into a bottle of water, and then saying that you have God, that you know God. Listen, we can know God because Jesus came. In John chapter, where was it? In John chapter 14, it says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So if you have seen Jesus, then you've seen the Father. Well, I haven't seen Jesus. He's dead. We have a record of his life. We know exactly how he lived. He's not dead, by the way. He's, he's up in heaven, right? He rose from the, the grave. That was, a, that was a slip of the tongue there, right? So 
We know how Jesus lived. And by mimicking Jesus, by understanding Jesus, we can become like Jesus. We actually then start to understand God and become like him. You see, we've been made in the image of God. We are in the image of God. If we're in the image of God, then what is that image? What is God? We need to know what makes God, God. So today, that's why I'm talking about holiness, that God is holy. So what does holy mean? Holy means this. It means to be set apart. To be set apart. That's all it is, to be separate, to be different, to be superior, to be distinct, for special godly use. I love that phrase, that holiness is to be set apart for special godly use. Oh, that's only for priests and pastors, right? That's only for people who actually have an actual ministry and they're being paid to do that. No, your whole entire life, regardless of who you are or where you are, can be set apart for special godly use right where you are, just as Stephen said, right where you are. So here's five things I want to look at, five things that we make holy in our lives. And the first one is this, the most obvious one is that God is holy, right? We believe that God, if you're, if you're a believer, if you're a Christ follower, if you're reading the scripture, you believe that God is holy. And there's this, this, there's this uh, uh, prophet in the Old Testament called Isaiah, and he has a vision, right? A vision of what God is and who God is. Not, he didn't actually go into the presence of God in the sense of that he saw him face to face. He had just had a vision of God, that God is high and he is holy, that he is superior, that he is perfect. And I would look at holiness like this. It's a little bit like the sun. Now, now pay attention to this example because I'm going to use it later on. I'm going to come back to it. It's like the sun. The sun gives out lots of goodness. The sun gives us so much stuff from, from, you know, that, that allows us to grow plants, to be able to eat, to be able to breathe oxygen. So much stuff can be attributed to what the sun does. And the sun is at a perfect distance from the earth. But if we decide to get too close to the sun, that sun is going to burn your skin off, right? You will be incinerated. That's what holiness is like. To imagine trying to come close to God, you have to come close to God in such a way that you've purified yourself. You've become holy so that holiness can be in the presence of God. Does that make sense? So here's Isaiah. Isaiah has this vision from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, and it says this, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. Quick description of what holiness is. It's high, it's exalted, and he's seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, that sounds like a weird thing. You know what a train is? It's like, you know, when a king or a queen has a robe and they walk around with their scepter and, their, and, their, you know, and all the other stuff that they've got, and they've got this long kind of cloak that shows that they're actually a king. But the length of their train, of their cloak, indicates exactly how important and how powerful they are. When I was a child, I don't know if you remember, there was a, there was a, 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 a person called Princess Diana, and she married the Prince of Wales in, in, in Britain. And when she got out of, the, uh, out of her carriage, she stepped out of her carriage, and this train kept coming out over and over and just kept spilling out of this carriage. It was 25 foot long. That's basically saying, this is a really important person. Right here, Isaiah sees this and he says, it's not just a long train. It's a train of his robe that fills the temple. It basically means his authority, his holiness, his significance is filling the whole of the temple of God. That tells me that there is no room for any pretenders. There is no room for any competition. Everything about God fills everything that he fulfills and fills. Above him were seraphim. Seraphim were basically the highest order of angels that were literally on fire themselves. The highest order of angels and the seraphim, each with six wings. And then it goes on to describe what those wings are. With two wings, they covered their faces. Why? Because they're saying, we can't look upon his holiness. It's like coming too close to the, the sun where I can't actually bear getting too close. You ever done that? You know, you get out on the beach and you're like, well, this is way too hot. And you have to run into air conditioning. Imagine Imagine being in the presence of God and you, you can't look at him. And it says, with two wings, they covered their feet, which basically means they can't stand in the presence of God without covering themselves. 
And with two, they were flying, which means that they were ready to do the bidding of God. And they were calling to one another, not to God. They weren't telling God this, this fact. They were telling each other, did you see? Did you see? Did you see? That? And then there's this shock of the revelation that they're seeing. And it says, and they were calling to each other. They were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And they were going, wow. And every time they would move a little bit, they would see another revelation of God and go, wow, that's holy. And they would see another part and go, whoa, that's holy. And they couldn't stop themselves from seeing how holy God is. That's only number one. This gets better, folks. Number two. Number two is this. We can make things holy. Things can become holy. In fact, we do this all the time, right? We, we're, we're always making things holy. And if you read in the news, they just found this guitar in an attic, which is actually John Lennon's guitar, right? This is, this is amazing guitar. And people are raving about the fact that they found this guitar that's been in an attic for 50 years or over 50 years. And someone bought it for $2.9 million. That's an expensive guitar. It's wood and metal strings. But someone has decided this is a holy object. It's a little bit like you ever heard the phrase, the holy grail. When you're looking for that ultimate object, you're looking for that ultimate thing that is a, be able to embody the passion that is in your heart. People do that when they're collecting things. They collect coins, they collect knives, they collect pottery, they, they collect so much stuff that people are collecting. They're looking for that ultimate one-of-a-kind holy grail. Just two weeks ago, someone sold a feather for 50, wait, how much was it? $46,000. This is a feather, fe, feller, a feather, he has grown a feather, a feather of an extinct bird from New Zealand. An extinct bird, and someone went, I'm willing to pay $46,000 for that. How many of you would have paid $46,000 for that? No one. Why? Because, it, oh, you would have? Oh, gosh, I have something to sell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I choked on my own laugh. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh my gosh. Here's the feather right here. Someone paid a lot of stupid money for this feather. And I get it, it's an extinct bird. Maybe it's just because they like collecting birds and feathers. And someone's willing to do it. But if you don't think of that as holy, then you're not actually going to give that much for it, right? We are making these things holy. Here's something that used to happen as well uh, a long time ago. When they used to build churches, they built churches in such a way that they made it the best that they could make it because they believed it was a holy object. This is actually a picture of, <clears throat> of the inside of my father's church where every panel of wood, every pew that is in here was hewn by hand. This is in the 1800s where they carved wood with their own hands. They didn't have machines to try and machine all this stuff. And even the stone on the outside is magnificent. And people chiseled it with their own hands. They were making a decision that this is worthy of my best because this is a holy building unto the glory of God. So I'm going to give my best to this thing because it's holy. Does that make sense? In fact, they did this with the Old Testament when they were building the temple. And he built it with the best stones, the best gold, the best material. Everything was the best, the best, the best, because it was holy. The third thing that I find that we can make holy is this. We can make experiences holy. Experiences can become holy. And most of us do this, especially around Christmas time, right? Who doesn't love Christmas? Does everyone love Christmas? Everyone loves Christmas, right? Christmas is something so special. What we do is we put up lights and fill up trees and candles, and it just gets us in that mood of a sacred moment of time, right? And some of you go absolutely nuts and build your houses like this, <laughs> right? It's like Santa Claus threw up on this house, right? Oh, absolutely, every, it's like Tammy Faye Baker ran into this house with all her makeup on, right? It's like it's just covered in color everywhere. There's even crazy people who literally rent storage to keep all their Christmas stuff for nine-tenths of the year. Insane, in my opinion. But they're doing this because they think of it as a holy moment. It's a holy experience for them. People even do that with church. 
You guys probably do it even on a Sunday morning where you're coming on Sunday morning because you believe this is a holy gathering. It's a holy experience and you're, you're enjoying it together. And it's like this feels like we're truly drawing into the presence of God because we're all collectively deciding that this is a holy experience. Or maybe it's not as holy as you think it is. Maybe you've said this is a holy experience for you, but maybe you actually make a decision. Maybe I'll come today. Maybe next week I won't come. Or maybe you get up in the morning and go, I don't mind if I'm late to church. I don't mind that we have all created a, a common experience of worshiping God, but today I don't feel like turning up on time and I won't make that effort. Your actions maybe don't follow your belief. Your behavior is not proving what your belief is. But many of you, it is very important to you. This is a holy moment and you're feeling the intensity of it. This is something of where we are worshiping God. The fourth thing that we do in making holy is this. The fourth thing that can be set apart is places can be made holy. Places can be made holy. This is especially true for anyone who's ever served in a war, who's ever lost any uh, uh, brothers or sisters in war. And to this year is actually the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landing where so many lives were lost. Americans, British, French, allies across the world who were trying to take down the axis of evil called the Nazis. And even this year, they're going to have people who are in their hundreds that are going to go to that ground because to them, it's hallowed ground, it's sacred ground, it's holy ground. And they'll go there and they'll remember what happened and they'll be in tears because they feel like that they're walking on holy ground. It's something that is so important to people. Last year, um, I went with my son and a few people in my family and we went to a place called Dachau. And Dachau was one of the, the first concentration camps uh, during the World War II. And when we went to, the, we went to the, 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 the building that had the gas chambers, I walked in and I was just looking around and I didn't realize it. And above one of the doors, it said, it said in German, showers or, or, or shower room. And that's when it hit me. I was standing on holy ground, but I didn't know it. And as I was standing there, I, you could feel the hush that was in the room and people milled around and walked around but they wouldn't say anything. And then we walked into this room, which is the ovens of where the image of God was destroyed before mankind. We're in the image of God. And when this image of God, the holiness of God, was destroyed in this room, it became holy ground. Not because we destroyed God, but because we didn't realize how important life was until we diminished it, until we treated it like next to nothing. Places can be holy. But the last thing that can be holy is I can be holy. God is holy. Things, experiences, and faces, places, and I can be holy. It doesn't mean I am holy, but I actually can be holy. Now, I'm going to break this down into two parts because there are two parts of our holiness. The first one is this. Position of holiness is the first part of our holiness. There must be a position of holiness. In Ephesians 1.4, it says this, For he, which is God, chose us in him, which is Jesus, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. God has chosen us before anything ever happened, before there was any ever sin that came into the world. He chose that we should be holy. He's deciding what our position, what our state is, not what our actions are, but he's deciding what our position and our state is. When I first got married and I, I was standing at the end of the aisle and my wife walks down the aisle and we decide to give our vows, which by the way, I just remembered in the first service that this is actually going to be my 25th anniversary in a few days. And I'm like, shoot, I should organize something. I'm taking up a fund to try and celebrate. I'm kidding. Um, uh, I just, it just suddenly dawned on me, oh my gosh, I better get something together. So 25th anniversary, very, very special. So anyway, as I was at the end of the aisle, and my wife walks down, no, she's not my wife yet, she walks down the aisle, and then she makes a covenant with me, and I make a covenant with her. And we've made this holy commitment to each other. We're saying, yes, we're going to give ourselves completely to one another. And when that happened, she instantly became my wife and I instantly became her husband. And today, I am not more her husband 25 years later than I was in that instant when I said I commit myself to you. In the same way, 
your status, your position with God is if you have said yes to Jesus, then you are declared holy by God. What God decided before the foundation of the earth is now true once you say yes to Jesus. That's the position of holiness. But here's the second part of our holiness, which is the harder part of our holiness. And it's this. It's the practice of our holiness. In 1 Peter verses 1, chapter 1, verse 15, it says this. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Be holy in all that you do, he says. We are now urged to not only just be in the status of holiness, but to live as holy too, to do things that are holy. You see, if I had said yes to Crystal and I said, yes, I'll be your husband, but I didn't turn up home, I didn't actually pay the bills, I didn't actually uh, become her living, active husband, am I really a husband? I'm a husband in name only. I'm a husband on a piece of paper but I have to actually live it out to prove that that's true. Your behavior must follow your belief. Now notice this. Now watch this. Watch this very closely. God is holy and I am holy. But oftentimes what happens is we put things, experiences, and places between me and God. We depend on things and experiences and places to make ourselves feel holy or to act holy. Now, in the Old Testament, that was true because when Jesus hadn't actually paid the price for our sin and we actually had to pay for our own sin uh, through, the, through the, 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 the nation of Israel, they had to have things and experiences and places that were holy. And so they used to have objects that were holy. They used to have sacred vessels. They used to have animal sacrifices. They used to have things that were prayed over and were treated as holy. They used to have experiences that were holy. They used to have to, a, a process of purity rituals, these rituals of, of purifying themselves and cleaning themselves before they could draw close to God. They would have to determine what type of food they could eat and what food they couldn't eat. And they weren't allowed to touch dead bodies. And, and they weren't, there's lots of things they couldn't do in case they became impure. They also had this place called the temple where they had an inner place, an inner room where you couldn't actually go into the inner room because that's where God's presence had restricted himself whilst he was amongst his people. But sometimes I think what we do as Christians is we often draw to the things, the experiences, and the places. I need my my favorite worship song on. I need to be in the building of the church. I need to do certain rituals in order to get close to God. But see, Jesus got rid of all these things. He made you holy that you can draw close to God. You just have to choose what's going to be holy in your life. You see, holiness must come from you. It's us who make things holy. How is that true? Because in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 12, it says, live such good lives, that means holy lives, live such holy lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Now, why would they glorify God on the day that he visits us? I'll tell you why. Because when you go outside in the sunshine, you can feel the sun, right? You can feel the heat that is coming. Imagine if the sun came to earth, you'll really feel the heat. Do you see what I'm saying? And when you feel the heat, you don't go, eh, it's a little bit warmer. I guess it's okay, right? When you feel intense heat, you go, whoa, 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 that's too much. I can't take that. You're literally glorifying God by saying, this holiness is so intense. This holiness is so great. I can't take it anymore. How would they know about God's holiness? Because of you. Because of what you've decided to make holy. Because you've chosen and chosen to take all the things in your life and make them holy. How do you eat? Is it holy? How do you drink? Is it holy? It's not about rules and regulations, but it's about what you consume. Do you can, when you're consuming food, are you consuming it like your body is holy? When you're drinking things, when you're, you're putting uh, uh, sugars or alcohols in your mouth, are you consuming it like you're treating it as holy or are you treating your body like a piece of junk? 
Are you treating this moment like it's not actually something that's meant to glorify God? What about what you watch? What about what, how you wear clothes? What about how you listen? How about you, how the way you speak or the way that you deal with your job or handle your money? Do you go to your job and decide this is a holy job? My job is, is God has put me in this position and therefore because God has made me holy, I am making this job holy. This job is holy ground. My money is holy ground. My life, my house, everything is holy ground. Listen, imagine if I got married to Crystal and I said to her, will you marry me? Will you please marry me? And she said, yes, absolutely. I am completely yours except one day a week. <laughs> Would you be okay with that? No, no, babe, not one day a week. We can't do that. It has to be all in. She goes, okay, well, how about once a month, I'm, I, only once a month, I'm not yours, but all the rest of the month, it's all yours. No, babe, that's not going to work for me. Okay, well, how about once every leap year? Can you at least give me a day? Do you think God would be good with that? So why do we think that there's certain parts of our lives that don't have to be holy? The whole thing has to be holy. The whole thing has to be holy. I don't mean you have to walk around like a monk going, ah, ha, 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 But you do have to treat it as holy. If God gave it to you, even if it's suffering, you can change that suffering into something significant, significant simply because you decide it's a holy experience. Years ago, my wife and I bought a house that was uh, about 20 years ago or something. Gosh, a long time ago. We bought our first house, and it was a piece of junk. It was just a piece of junk. You're like, thanks, God. Really appreciate this. But I knew that that was the gift that God had given me, so I had to show myself as trusted. And so we stripped out all the drywall. It was just a piece of junk, and we had to change everything. And, and uh, uh, Jim Sellers helped me be able to expand it, him and his brother, and uh, gave me su such generosity to help me to build this house into the thing that I wanted it to be because I wanted it to be a place of peace. I wanted it to be a place that I, wanted, I could bring people in and say, come and experience peace. Come and experience what it is to live in the presence of God. And so I, I started discipling people out of my house. I started to have groups there because I decided that my house was holy ground. I decided to take a piece of junk that had been misused and turn it into holy ground. And then a few years later, I was driving home and I was coming into my neighborhood and I noticed that the front entrance of the neighborhood was just badly treated by everyone. You'd have trash that was put out there. No one mowed the grass. No one edged it or, or picked up the weeds or the trash or that. And the fence was broken. I was looking at it and I started to get irritated because people were mistreating our neighborhood. And I looked at it and I'm like, this is not right. And it really irritated me. And then one day I felt God convicted me and said, but that's my neighborhood. That's the entrance to my neighborhood. And I realized I had a chance to make it holy. So for 10 years, I looked after the entrance of that neighborhood. And I looked after it like it belonged to God. If God was coming to my house today, he has to come through the entrance of this neighborhood. Does he see me only taking care of my stuff over here, but not taking care of the road that leads up to my house? Does he see me taking care of the things that, that, that benefit me, but not actually taking care of the things that benefit other people? You see, holiness is who God is, and he's made you holy, so you're meant to make other things holy. Places, things, experiences, you can make it holy. That's how much power and authority you have. Take that for the ocean and put it in a bottle. You're the bottle. You're the vessel. You carry the holiness. Take it to the world. Would you not want to be a part of that? Would you not want to see that happen in your life? Let's stand as we end our service this morning. Father in heaven, we want to ask for your forgiveness and we repent for the things that have come to our minds that we have mistreated, that we have not made holy. Lord, I pray that you would give us a revelation of what other areas in my life that I have to make holy, that I have to submit and commit to the service of the Most High. Thank you, Father, for declaring us as holy. 
Thank you that you have decided that we can be like Jesus and you gave us an example. And we pray today that you'd fill us with your spirit in such a way that we can live out the great calling of holiness to the rest of this world. We ask this in your precious son's name and all God's people said, amen. May God bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.